Okay, all right. So let's get started. Okay, so we'll continue from last time talking about market power, and then talk about different models for competition. All right. So after that, we're going to sort of more of system operation and look at several services. But for the first part today, we'll sort of think more about market power. Basically, what happens if you can influence price? Right. So in all of this, we're going to ignore the case where you're a monopoly. If you're a monopoly, it's not interesting. You do whatever you want, right? If you're a monopoly. So even with market power, we're gonna assume that you cannot just pick the price. There's some process where you can uh, choose how to change the price. Okay, so from last time, remember one key thing is that, right, so all firms, benefit if any one firm okay so this is really sort of what's weird about the electricity market is in almost other markets it is the uh, your competitors who will complain if you access market power in electricity nobody complains if you access market power but you'll be happy if somebody happened to access market power and cause the price to go up, right? So that, that's this sort of weird about electricity markets. Okay. The thing to remember is changing output or offers is legal, okay? So if you're a firm, you're a generator, it's perfectly fine if you want to change your output, change your offer, right? If you can generate 100 megawatt, you say you only generate 50, that's completely fine. Okay, that's completely illegal. There's no restriction on what you can do. The only thing you cannot do is, uh, so collusion is not allowed. Okay, so you must basically offer independent. It says as each, so in essence, in practice, what this says is each generator offer it independently. So you cannot talk to the other generators and uh, figure out what to do in the market. All right, so this in practice, again, you're limited to the number of generators you can own as a firm. You cannot buy all the generators in some system. Okay, so they'll check that you, you can, you know, even if you're a very big company, you're only allowed to buy a few generators or that if you own a lot of generators, each of generator must operate as independent entities. Collusion is normally very hard to prove in the market. It's normally very, very hard to prove that two, you know, two generators has colluded. Okay, so you have a very stiff penalty, right? If you have collusion, FERC is Federal Electricity Regulatory Commission. Other people that will sue you. FERC has an army of lawyers whose job is to sue people for collusion. And uh, you know, if you get sued by FERC, there will be very heavy fines. Okay, so if you have, if you're doing collusion, think of fines in the terms of hundreds of millions of dollars of fines. If you find if FERC can prove you have colluded, okay, right. So the reason inclusion is very difficult to prove is you know everybody's happy you're accessing market power. So it's hard to say is that are you just both accessing market power or you happen to clue or happen to do something like this. Okay, but anyways, there are sort of you know armies of lawyers and uh, people in every in all the system operators in FERC basically monitor inclusion. This you cannot. Everything else is perfectly fine, perfectly legal. Okay. All right, so this is market power. And the one question is that market power for things like storage, solar, wind. So basically any of the new technologies is not well understood. Okay. 
Okay, so one big thing is if you're storage, and uh, let's say if you're one and uh, you build a storage, this is in some sense a good thing, right? You, storage helps you to firm the wood. Can you you can you sort of derive market power from things like that? Yes. You can create examples where a storage does not decrease system cost, the storage can increase system cost. It's not it's not hard to make that happen. And in many simulations, that does happen. Because having a storage does not mean your system cost reduces, which is weird. Because think of storage is one option is to not use the storage. That's your base system. Now you're allowing something else potentially can help you to optimize system operation. That does not always decrease the system cost. Okay? So storage is weird. We don't quite know how to define market power for these things. We don't quite know what it means. So a lot of, again, research is uh, sort of open for this kind of thing. So that's, that's we don't know what happens. Okay. So that's just something to keep in mind, right? So that if you see generators adjusting their output to increase the price, just remember that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Then two of the sort of more uh, abstract or mathematical models when you think about, there's two basically competition models. So now you think about people, this sort of strategic firms interacting, uh, that's a hard thing to get handled on in real life. So most times we take look at two different kind of abstract models. So these two are two, sort of two people, Bertrand and Cornell, who started looking at uh, earlier, looking at this kind of competition. And uh, for Bertrand model is basically what you do is you compete on prices. So you try to lower your price to undercut the other competitors you have. This is how we can think of, you know, how you sell phones work, right? Like if you sell cars or something like this, you're going to your price, okay? This is a good model for many uh, commodities. Turns out not very good for electricity. It's a bit weird for electricity. So then we'll look at Cornell model, which is the competition on quantities. So now you don't compete on price anymore. You're not trying to undercut somebody. You basically control how much stuff you sell. This is a more uh, better fit for electricity. Okay, so this this is a better fit for a lot of commodities. This just happened to be for electricity. But both of these are studied, and there are models for uh, competition. Okay. So in practice, what you can have is you can have competition, uh, of course, both price and quality. You don't have to compete only one of them. But then that's a much harder problem. We, we, we don't have much equations for that. So look, we'll separate this call. We'll separate price. Combination on price or combination on quantity. Okay. So this ends up being, you have to consider what's so-called a Nash equilibrium and game theory. So we'll look at an extremely simplified version of what game theory is. Okay, so our extremely simplified of game theory is you can think of the following case. We can first think of, let's say two players. So the, where a player is used interchangeably with agents or firms or producers, they all mean the same thing, basically two entities in the system. And what does each entity do? Okay, so what we give is there is a A1 and A2. These are the actions. So here, think of this being either you setting the quantity or price or something, right? So there are some actions that the agents or the players can take. So I think of two generators saying how much power you produce for each other's generator. Now that's the quantity. There's actions. Now you have something else you have. So in your book, this is called omega, omega one, omega two. This is called the payoff. Okay, so this is payoff. This is how much money you get, right? So this is the amount of money or the amount of utilities you receive. Okay, so that's called a payoff. This is in think of term of dollars. Okay, think of term of money as your payoff. Then basically, how is your payoff determined? Your payoff is determined as a function 
of both of the actions. Okay, so this is a game. The thing about game is your payoff not only determines on what you do, it determines on what the other player does, right? So this is two player game. Any questions about this? Two player game, right? So each of the players takes some action. Then jointly, they determine the payoff. They determine how much money player I should make. Yeah. Any questions about this? This is the basic game theory setup, okay? So for us, think of the actions, think of them as real numbers. So you give them two real, each of the player pick a real number, some payoff, another real number comes up. Okay, so Nash equilibrium. So now it's a sort of seemingly simple concept, but uh, really sort of formalized by Nash and von Neumann. Is Nash equilibrium is following. So Nash equilibrium will give this A1 star, A2 star. Okay, so what is a Nash equilibrium? Nash equilibrium is where your payoff, so if you fix, so the way to read it is the following, is if your, play, if your player won, okay, so if your player won, you're at Nash equilibrium, if you play A1 star, A2 star, this is larger than a1, A2 star for every A1. Okay, so this is the way to read a Nash equilibrium. As your player one, so this is a superscript to indicate which player you are. Player one, if player two plays the A2 star, your best strategy is A1 star. Okay, player two plays A2 star, the optimizer for you is A1 star, right? And this is equilibrium if this holds true for both one and two. Okay, so player two, A1 star, A2 star, this is larger than equal to if you play a two. Okay, right? So this is a pair of actions. If you play this pair of action, you maximize your profit if no if sorry, if the other player is fixed then you maximize your profit by playing on this action. Okay, so this is what Nash equilibrium means. Right, so what this ends up boiling down to is if you're at equilibrium, any player have no incentive to deviate. Right, so if your player, let's say in this case, your player won, player two says I'm playing A2 star, then you have no incentive to change from A1 star. Right, if you're, in the same thing, in this case, if player two, player one plays a two, a one star, then the best you can do is play a two star. Right. So this uh, this is an equilibrium because neither of the players will want to change by themselves. Okay. This does not mean you're maximizing the payoff. It just means that you by unilaterally you will not do a change. Okay. This is not the joining optimal. This doesn't mean you maximize both of them. Right, so that's just a unilaterally, you won't you won't do a change. Okay, so this is a Nash this is a Nash equilibrium. Not all Nash equilibrium will have not all games will have Nash equilibrium. Okay, there are many many games that does not have a Nash equilibrium. Not all games will have a this so called a pure Nash equilibrium. Okay, so if you think of a game, right? So let's think of rock paper scissors. What is the Nash equilibrium of two people playing rock, paper, scissors? So it's a perfectly well defined game. You pick an action, I pick an action, right? You want to win. So your their omega is let's say the number of times you win, the chance you win. What is the Nash equilibrium there in rock, paper, scissors? What strategy will you play? Can you think of a strategy? It's an equilibrium strategy, right? Right, so your equilibrium strategy in rock, paper, scissors cannot be picking any one action, right? That, that, that's not an equilibrium. You do better at picking something else. So in rock, paper, scissors, your equilibrium turns out to be as 
you randomly choose with one third probability the action you will play. The other player chooses randomly with one third probability the action they will play independently. That's the equilibrium, right? You cannot do that. If your opponent is choosing randomly with one third chance, your best bet is choose one third randomly one third chance. Okay, so that's the equilibrium. And that's called a mixed Nash equilibrium. So what John Nash proved is all those games will have mixed Nash equilibrium. There is a probability distribution that's an equilibrium. Not as very that's not super useful in practice. So here, what this is showing, this is called a pure Nash equilibrium. You don't need to randomize. Okay, they're just fixed numbers. So it's very difficult in practice to prove things will. It's often very difficult to prove that things will have pure Nash equilibrium. From now on in the rest of this course, we'll assume everything we see will have a pure Nash equilibrium. It's just an assumption we'll make. Okay, so we'll assume. Okay, we we'll assume there are Nash pure Nash equilibria. Uh, that's an assumption. Uh, it's very often very very difficult to prove. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. Right, so for more than two players, you generalize this way. So let's take a case to look at what happens when we have more than two players. So let's take a look when you have more than two players. So there you're not compared against any pairwise player. Now you compare against the rest. So this is called an player game. Okay, so the action is the same. You have a one, a two, da da da, a n. You have the payoff. Sig sigma one. Sigma two. Sigma n. So your natural equilibrium is defined following. A1 star, A2 star, AN star. This is right. So if you this the payoff you get here is greater than if you fix the action of everybody else at this equilibrium and you only change your own, then your payoff, you cannot have a greater payoff. Okay, so there before is you change A1, you fix A2. Here is for one, you fix A2 up to AN, you only change your own play. Okay, you only change your own play. Then you cannot do worse. This has to hold for every player. Minus one star, a n for every a n. Okay, right. So this is basically saying that for the ice player, you fix everybody else, you change your own, you cannot do better. Right. So that's an equilibrium. That's a Nash equilibrium. Okay, good. Right. So the the reason this was sort of the big result is proving that even a mixed Nash equilibrium exists. As a short proof, but it's quite a sort of non-trivial way to think about the proof. So for any for any of you who have taken ever taken analysis, I wonder when is all this sort of function analysis useful for this this kind of proof, proving there exists an equilibrium, basically requires function analysis. That's where analysis knowledge comes in. Things like, you know, yeah, so what happens to functions? on a compact space actually matters here. That's how you prove all of those things. So Nash equilibrium is nice in concept, pretty much impossible to compute in any practical situations. Okay, so it's a useful tool for us to gain some insight. Nobody ever goes to a real system and say, show me the Nash equilibrium. It's not computable in most cases, right? So it's a useful thinking tool, right? But uh, so we're gonna sort of think using this kind of idea. So any more questions about Nash equilibrium? There are books on books on Nash equilibrium, so you're interested. And uh, 
Again, the electricity market, in some sense, is built up on reaching Nash equilibrium. But uh, it just that is very hard to specifically compute Nash equilibrium in practice. Okay, so it's MP, right? There's in complexity theory, there's a whole thing about how hard this is to compute. But for now, anyways, we'll look at a competition. It's called a Bertrand competition. So here, the action is the price. Okay, so action for each player is you change your price. Right, so for any time you give a game, you say, I want to understand what the game is. You have to define what is your action. So here you can change your price. And then what is your payoff? Okay, so Bertrand conversation is this example. But it says, let's say you have two generators, you're operating, you're supplying a load. Okay, so you have an inverse demand curve. So the price is 100 minus the total load you support. Okay, and then you have some true cost. Right, so A is cheaper than B. There's some true cost. But you can bid whatever you want. Okay, you can bid whatever you want. And the bid you submit as your price. What price do you want to generate electricity at? Okay, so given your bid, that determines the market price, that determines the quantity being traded. Okay, so if you're bidding, you know your true price, that's where that doesn't matter to a system operator, you're going to bid. Okay. So in this case, what is the bid people will make, right? So let's say if you're generator A, how will you bid in this case? Right. So you know your marginal cost is $35 per megawatt hour. You know the marginal cost of B is $45 per megawatt hour. What will your bid be? Maybe you bid just below B, even like 24. Right. So you can steal all that. Right, good, right? So here is the general A, you basically want to corner the market, right? So what you know is I'm cheaper than B. So if I go below B, I can still make some money. So what you bid is you basically bid 45 minus that's one, like 44.9, like 44.9, right? So that's, that will be your bid, right? The, B cannot do anything there. B cannot undercut that. B will be losing money. So B is better off for doing nothing. Okay, so basically as A bids 45 minus epsilon, right? So epsilon is an arbitrarily small number. B doesn't do anything. B, B, B cannot, B is completely out of the market now. Be squeezed completely out of the market. So what is the price? Well, so the market price pi is 45 minus epsilon. Right? So pi is whatever A decide to bid. Then what is your demand? Right. So this is 100 minus demand. Demand is roughly 55 megawatt. Right. So do you given the price, you can compute the demand. And then a generates all of this. B does nothing. Okay, so this is a Bertrand conversation. Any questions about this? Right. So you basically under you bid by undercutting people. If you undercut the other people in the market, you completely squeeze them out of the market. Right. So this is. Again, when you're selling cars, for example, right? You're selling the same car. If your epsilon is cheaper, everybody buys from you, then you're the only one there. Okay. So this is the idea. The thing that's weird about Bertrand competition is now let's say you have the same cost. Okay, so let's say you have the same cost. Let's say B somehow also managed to reduce their cost and got to 35. Now what happens is now things basically become a very weird corner case, right? Both of them cannot bid below 35. Bidding above 35 doesn't make any sense. You're out of the market if you bid above 35. So here pi will be 35, right? This, you, there's, you cannot be below it, you cannot be above it. And then here basically the market breaks down. 
as A can generate whatever it wants, B can generate, right? So you have a demand at 65, but P and PB can be anywhere between zero and 65 that you cannot determine what this is, right? So demand is 100 minus pi, this is 65 megawatt, this is dollar per megawatt, hour, but PA plus PB, this just need to add up 65 megawatt hour, okay. right? And uh, you cannot really determine what A should generate, what B should generate, if you have identical generators, right? To the market, they're the same. So you cannot differentiate between the more costly one and the less costly one, okay? So this is not a great model for competition. Right, so the so why doesn't this happen in practice? Let's say again, you're selling cars. Why doesn't this happen? This is predicted for electricity. You get into this weird corner cases, so you can't determine the solution. Let's say you're selling anything else. This situation doesn't really come up. Right, so basically, if you're selling anything else, to any other commodity, there's a notion of transporting. You have to give the commodity somebody else. So even they're the same price, you can say I break the tie by going to the closest one to you, or I break there are different tie breaking procedures you can employ to differentiate who does how much. Electricity being a connected system, once the price is the same, you really cannot tell which generator should generate how much. Okay, this is just really they become identical to the system. There's, there's no difference when you're generating electricity. Okay, so this is a, and so this is a weird case as you, you can't tell about this. And also, if let's say CB is 35 plus epsilon, then PA gets all the market, right? So if you increase the cost by a little bit, then suddenly you go into, you go from a case where you cannot distinguish which generator has how much to a generator gets a whole market. Okay, so that's just the way that Beltran competition works. And so this is not very realistic or not a very good model, I say, for electricity market. Okay, so this is not a terribly good model for electricity market. Is again because there's a single commodity, you don't need to transfer the commodity, you basically just get it, and uh, this is not too useful. Okay. So this kind of combination can get especially weird if you have something less than renewable. Okay, you have a renewable generator that has zero price, then this combination gets really, really weird. Right. So that's sort of two renewables try to undercut each other. You get this sort of very weird equilibrium that comes out, that's not reasonable. Okay, so a better sort of example is so-called Cournot competition. And Cournot actually predates uh, Nash by quite some time. This was developed in the 1860s, 1870s. And what this is trying to say is the following. So if you look at Cournot competition, basically, Cournot did not like the competition on the price. That was not a super realistic model. So what Cournot competition is a competition in quantity. So what Cournot assumes, assumes the following. So again, we'll do a two uh, player case, but in other, in more players, so it will be very similar. It says you look at the total quantity, okay? So you look at this is y1 plus y2. Okay, you look at the total quantity you have. Now then what you have is you have a price that is determined by the, okay, so you have a price that is determined based on the total quantity you can supply. Okay, so this is quantity. Right. So you have a price that's only dependent on the total quantity, not on the individual quantities. Okay. So this determines your price. So here you have some market power. What you do does impact the price. 
what you do doesn't tell the price. But I can't think the specific form of uh, price depending on the sum of the quantities. Okay. And then what Cornell says is the following. Let's say for player one, then what are you trying to maximize now? You're trying to maximize your quantity times price. This is the solution you're trying to maximize. Plus, subtract to the cost of producing this quantity. Okay, so you're maximizing y1. And this is now the payoff depending on the Right, so you have a payoff, right? So your payoff is here. Okay. Any questions about this formula? Right, so you're given what you do is you fix y2, you fix y2, you cannot change y2 anymore. You change your own y1, this will impact this price, will impact this whole function, and you're trying to maximize this. Okay, so here y2 is fixed. Right, so you fix this number, you're trying to maximize this thing. Player two, your payoff is now you're going to maximize over y2. This is y1 is fixed. Okay, so there you could define natural equilibrium a Nash equilibrium is where if you do this for iteratively, you have a fixed point of y1 star, y2 star. That's your Nash equilibrium. Okay, so if you fix, right? So here you have a Nash equilibrium, y1 star, y2 star. This basically comes out. If you do this optimization, the solution doesn't change anymore. Right? So this is a fixed point of this optimization problem. Right, so that's right, okay. So that's the corner model is we're gonna compete on quantity as a generator, we're gonna tell the system how much we'll generate. And this will determine how much we get paid because price depends on the total sum minus our own uh, fixed cost. And then this is the uh, solution we have, okay, all right. Okay, so the question basically here is, when would a Nash equilibrium exist? Okay, so that was a hard question for Cornell. Cornell did not give a full answer. This says, you can write this down. You know, how do you know there's a fixed point? And this was solved in the 1960s. It was a very influential paper by Rosen gave the answer to this thing, basically. We're not gonna look at that. We're gonna look at some examples and see what happens for this kind of Cornell computation. And that's very interesting, okay? So the example we'll look at is uh, one energy bidding. Okay, so if you remember the supply curve we have, our, our price curve was something like this, right? This, this is our price curve. This is the demand. This is what's the price, okay? So what we'll do is we'll think of this part being a fairly linear function, okay? So, so let us think of this as a, we'll focus on this part of the curve, so we'll treat it roughly like a linear function. Okay, we'll say this is you know, linear with some slope, okay? So now what we'll think of is if you're one, basically, if you're one fitting to the system, what happens is the demand will decrease. Okay, so one have zero cost. So one fitting to the system is effectively decreasing demand, right? So it's in fact decreasing demand. So if you integrate one into the system, uh, it's basically this line going down, you're decreasing the price. Okay. So we're gonna think of one as negative demand,
Okay, so right, so we'll have one last negative demand. So what the idea here is if you have x1, x2 being the amount of wind a bit into the market. Or just x1, let's say x, x. Okay, so let's say x is the amount of the wind will bid into this market. And the more you bid, this is negative demand. So you're reducing, you're reducing this price. Okay, so now if you draw the curve that is, or let's say y, let's be consistent. This is y, y with price, y is amount of one thing bidding, so the price decreases linearly. Linearly, right? So if you have no wind, you start off as some large value up there. You have more and more wind, your price drops down as you have more and more wind. Okay, so this is just this curve flipped around. This you have this straight line flipping around. Okay, so the more wind you have, the uh, let's sort of say the lower the prices. Okay, so the lower the prices. Any questions about this? Okay, right, so this lower the prices. So now you can ask the question of, if you're one producer, how much do you want to bid into the market? Okay, so we'll give this thing a slope. We'll say this is one minus alpha times y. Okay, so just alpha some slope. We'll assume that you're starting off with a value of one. We can normalize everything so that you have this value of one. So as a computation, so you're one. Now you're not price taker, right? So if you're price taker as a one, what you do is you basically pay the maximum, pay it up to your capacity. Now your price anticipatory, you know that if you change the, at least if the total one changes, the price will change. Okay, so let's see what is the consequence of this. Right, so let's say you have a single wind farm. Okay, so what if, what is your optimization problem now? As you're trying to maximize y times pi times y, okay. you do not have any cost, right? We're a wind, we have no operating cost, so this is it. You don't have to subtract the term out of this. Okay, so this is maximize. Max y y times one minus alpha y, right? So your job is to maximize this. Questions about this? Okay, right, so this, you're maximizing this. So to maximize this, you basically, you're maximizing y squared. So you can take a derivative. This is one minus two alpha y equals to zero, y star equals to zero y star is one over two alpha, okay. All right, so this does, if you know that you, you impact the price, what do you do is you don't bet your limit. You basically, you only bet up to a finite quantity because you bet more, you're actually decreasing your profit. Okay, your profit is your, when you multiply by the, uh, right, so it's, uh, you're multiplying by the price, okay? The issue there is alpha is basically a slope of that line. And as we saw last class, this slope is actually quite steep. Alpha is pretty large, alpha is not a small number. So the consequence is that this Y star is actually quite small if you build this way. Okay, this is a small, this is alpha is typically large. Okay, so this has given the current market we have, if you're a wind producer, it's not to your best, you know, it's not to your best interest to bid a lot. 
into the system. And so your best interest better if you bet a little bit, because as the more you bet, the faster the price decrease is really fast. Right? So there's two numbers multiplying each other. And this is going up linearly. This is decreasing linearly, but with a very large slope. So this is going down much faster than this is going up. So you, your maximum occurs at a small number. Okay, a small number. Any questions? Thanks. No, not really, right? This is just so steep up there. It's not like, being linear. It's just for ease of calculation. We can do this calculation. But your problem anyways is basically increasing y, the price is dropping faster than that y multiplying. That's basically your problem. Right? You just can't get this thing. Why doesn't it increase fast enough for the corresponding to the price drop? Right? It's a fundamental issue is that that curve is so steep once you get to the end. There's not much you can do there. Okay. So now the interesting let's look at is what happens if you have two wind farms. And let's play this game again. Okay, let's see if we do better. Right? Let's see if we do better. But better in the sense that as a system, we want more and more wood. Right? We want more wind farms into the system. That's cleaner energy, cheaper energy. So this is a limitation of the market. Right? It's just, you can't force wind to bit more. It's just not to its own benefit. So let's say you have two wind farms. And so now what you're doing is you have y1 and y2. Yeah, you have y1 and y2. So y1 solves maximize y1, y1, y minus alpha, y1 plus y2, right? y1 is trying to solve this optimization problem. y2 is trying to solve max y2. So y2 is trying to solve this problem, right? So y1, you're assuming y2 is given to you, you maximize over yourself. y2, is you assume y1 is given to you, you maximize over yourself, okay? So let's take a derivative and see what equation we get. So here, this is max minus alpha y1 squared minus alpha y1 y2, right? So this is just expanding this equation now. This is max y2, y2 minus alpha y2 square minus alpha y1 y2. So here you take a partial derivative with respect to y1. Okay, right, so it's just a partial derivative. But again, the game is you only have control of what you do, right, of y1. So that's why it's a partial derivative, not a, a full derivative. Here, y2, this is one minus two alpha y2 minus alpha y1, okay? Any questions up to this step? Okay, so Nash equilibrium is basically the pair of y1, y2 that will solve this equation at the same time. Okay, so y1, y2 is Nash equilibrium, and both of these derivatives come out to be zero. Right? So that's when both of you cannot include your uh, payoff anymore. So here you can, right, so at Nash equilibrium, this is zero, this is zero, they're both zeros. Okay, so now you can, this is basic, this is a matrix solution. Right, so this is a matrix equation we have. So we want to solve this equation. Right? So I solve this matrix equation. So here we have y1, y2. What is the determinant to this thing? This is, this is alpha, two, one, one, two. So this is determinant, this is, Two one determinant two one one two. This is 
four minus one is three, right? So that's with three. So this is one over three alpha. One, one. Okay, so you have those kind of numbers. Is this right? Oh, no. One through alpha, two, two minus one minus one. Okay, so you have this kind of solution. So this is, you multiply this out. This is one, basically one over three alpha, one over three alpha. Okay, so here, this is your uh, Nash equilibrium. This is your Nash equilibrium, okay? Any questions after here? They're just solving this with some equations. Okay, so here, the sum, Okay, so, right, so you have this. This is larger than one over two alpha. This is larger than one over two alpha. The one over two alpha was a solution if you only have one one farm. This is a solution when you have two one farms. So what happened is this is you're seeing the outcome of competition. Okay, as you have add more competition, the total amount of the sort of free energy here increases. Okay, so your next homework will be asked to show this as a number of players goes to infinity, missing basically the sum will go to, you know, what? Basically the sum will go to the largest possible value. Okay, so this is an example showing what happened from Cornell competition is that uh, as the number of players increase, each of them has less market power. So the sorry the total cost in the market reduces, and uh, the sort of the price in the market goes down. I remember price was one minus alpha times y, so the price equilibrium price went down. Okay, so Cournot captures this kind of competition in the electricity market. Okay, any questions about Cournot competition? The Cournot competition is fairly easy to model. It's basically you have this. Uh, inverse demand function, as long as you know this pi of y, you can just do this calculation. Right? You, you can just figure out this calculation. For this class, we know there's Nash equilibrium because we can solve this matrix of equations. Right? We can solve this, uh, invert this matrix. So this is the only Nash equilibrium. For more, for nonlinear functions, it's not as clear. You may not be always be able to solve this but uh, you observe something similar. And so here is again, the more competition, the better it is for the system. With the challenge again for one is normally you have this sort of random capacity, right? One may not always be there. So you have that sort of stochastic competition is much more difficult. But at least for deterministically, this is a competition you can think about. Okay, so. This is showing you that for oligopoly, as the number of players increases, you get into a price taker range. Okay, you essentially get into perfect competition as n goes infinity. Yeah, so for most market you set up, you want to do this type of analysis. As as n goes infinity, at least you should approach a perfect market. If even when n goes infinity, your market is not very good, then there's some problem with your market demand. Okay. Okay. Questions? Okay, so this is as much as we'll say for competition. You'll see more of these for in the next homework, which will probably be up next week. But uh, we won't go any deeper into game theory. So the, the really challenging part of applying game theory to electricity market is because constraints. And game theory sorry, is not very good with constraints. So that's why this is sort of where we'll stop. Okay, so now let's take our five minute break. Then we'll switch topic a little bit. We'll look at things like ancillary services. We'll go beyond just applying energy. A little bit. But let's take a break before that. Participants has no choice. There's only one power system you can use. Regardless how many markets you have, there is only one physical system you can use. There's only one wire going to your home. Right? This is a good where power is, let's say, different than, say, 
your cellular service, right? There's multiple cellular services that covers your home. Power, there is only one physical wire. Okay, is that wire to your home needs to work? Okay. So basically, your you know cost if there's outage to you is very very high, right? And uh, we all have some expectation of the power being there. Okay, we we have some expectation of having power. So anybody know what the standard for this is? Okay, so the, the way the standard in power system calculus is the following is, how long do you expect to go between one hour of power outage? There is a standard in the system. Anybody know what that number is? You, that's, that's a number that your system is being judged on. There's a federal agency that looks at your reliability and there's a target number. Anybody know what that is? Like how long? Do you expect to go when you see one hour outage? So there's a standard and there's sort of the practical <laughs> what we see. Right? So in practice for you, so how often did you experience outage? Like what is the mean time between two outages for you? Power outage. Right, so we'll see, you know, for Seattle right now, it's about once every year or so, depending on where you live. You can live in some places that every time there's a windstorm, you have a power outage. If you live around university district, you're actually luckier. The, the lines here are more robust, depending on where you live, right? But the actual here, the, the NERC standard, which nobody meets now, nobody, this, this is standard is going away. This is one hour outage, every 10 years. Okay, so you used to get fined if you don't meet the standard. Now nobody misses. Like if you be in the West Coast, there's a wildfire, you have three days of outage every year. Like if you're in the Bay Area, you have at least a day of outage every year. Right, so that translates to, I don't know, like 240 years to see less, something like this, right? So nobody's meeting this, but still we have some expectation. And there's big debate. Basically, so here is how do you balance the cost versus versus this kind of expectation, right? So that we don't know. But right now we're gonna see that you know how do you maintain system security? So system security basically means that your system should, of course, your system should operate continuously if nothing changes. And that's the base case you optimize for. But also your system should operate under common contingencies. Okay, so what are common contingencies in our system? What's the con contingency that's considered the common? So this can include line faults. Okay, your, your line suddenly goes down. So this again happens all the time. Line faults happens all the time. Okay, every system, every day you have like five line faults, right? This is not a rare event. Okay, so common contingencies are really these are not rare events. Okay, so you have generator failures. Again, not rare. It's not very rare to have one generator failure. This happens. And then you have rapid changing load. Okay, so these are typically considered three of the common contingencies. So what is uncommon, for example, is these are sort of single line fault, single generator failures. Okay, these are considered common. Uncommon is something like earthquakes that takes out 40% of the system. That's uncommon. Right? You're not expected to operate a system under there. You are expected to operate a system under this type of, so single faults and uh, single generators. So this is a single fault. This is a single failure. Okay, so this is how we operate this. And basically, the, there's two ways to deal with this kind of contingencies. One is called preventive action. What this means is you basically 
have some reserve margins for your system. So you operate your system in such a way that if fault happens, you just write through, you don't need to do anything. So for example, if your load is uh, 500 megawatt, you may plan for the load being 600 megawatt, knowing that if the load changes, I'm still okay. So this is easy, but expensive. So the harder but more efficient thing is called corrective action. Okay, so this is where you have to do something if a fault happens, but uh, you only do this when you see the fault. Preventive means that I don't care whether the fault happens or not. I'm just going to do this, right? I'm going to have some margin, okay, safety margin. Okay, so these are the two sort of broad classes of uh, things we operate. And by far, we are we do sort of preventive actions. This is just much, much easier than corrective ones. Okay, so preventive actions is it just uh, if system offers contingency happens, we don't need to do anything, the system still works. So this is basically you operate the system at less than full capacity. So that's, that's the action you do. So there are examples like this is the every generator has 10% headroom. Okay, so if your generator, you, you take your physical limit, you do, divide that by, you know, multiply that by 0.9, you have some room left over, you can maneuver around. That, that's my system. Uh, you can have headroom, you can have, you know, all transmission lines. Have some slack, right? So I don't use all my transmission lines, it artificially reduces the amount you can flow on the transmission line. You have an example like this. So basically, this is preventive. So if something happens, Again, you don't need to do anything. There's slack in the system that pick it up. Okay, so the sorry, the current system practice is to schedule enough generation such that the load can be supported if the largest generator fails and 50% of the second largest generator fails. Okay, so, the, so this is sort of not a physical thing. But what it is is you take your load, you take your generator. Now you ask yourself, what is the worst case for this? You know, what do I think the worst case is? So the worst case is the large generator can go offline. You need to be able to still support the load after that. Plus 50% of whatever the second large generator is generating, that amount of generation can go offline. Okay, so this is the, in many systems, this is a rule of thumb you use, is how much generation slack you need in the system. Okay. This differs from system to system, right? This depending on where your large generator is. So for California, there'll be a nuclear generator. So in California, this works out to be about four gigawatt of power there. So California is about a 50 gigawatt peak system. So this is slightly less than 10% headroom you're keeping. Right? So you're not using this. This is you're keeping there. If things fail, so you can keep it. Okay, so in the US, this is typically nuclear. This is, again, nuclear. So this translates to the largest nuclear power plant goes down, 50% of second largest generation you use. Okay, so you keep this. This is obviously inefficient. Right? You have to keep this, it's inefficient, but this is an easy way to make sure the system uh, maintains security. Any questions here? Okay, so this, you just keep these things there. They don't do anything. And so corrective action is 
more efficient is us, you know, let's do something only after things happen. Okay, so so this is saying I'm not going to put it there, right? Already, I'm going to wait and see if something happens. So this coffin takes in terms of ancillary services. Right, so this is, for example, you call on something if a line fails, right? So this can be, you call on say storage or call for generators, right? So the difference between preventive is in preventive actions, these things are already online. You don't need to ask them what you do. In corrective is if you detect something happens, then what you do is you can run a very quick market to determine who wants to supply the imbalance. So storage tends to do this a lot. That's called the frequency regulation market. It's basically you look at the particular supply and demand imbalance, you try to make that up. Okay, so you don't have this thing being standby. So this is a market. This is typically a market based. Right? You, 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 if something happens, you ask people how much do I have to pay you to be here? Com the capacity is important. Okay, so you care about if something happens, are there enough people in your system who will respond? Okay, you don't want to run into a situation where you ask people that don't want to respond, then what do you do? That's the same thing. Right? So you can run into problem here. So often the payment on capacity. Okay, so you, for example, you tell storage, hey, you know, if you are willing to do this, I'll pay you some money to be in this market to provide capacity. I may not call on you. If I call on you, I'll pay you more, but I'll pay you something just to be here, right? Okay, so there's sort of this corrective action is you're not always used. Whereas preventive, you're basically connecting to a big generator saying just be there, generate. I'm gonna pay you as if you're generating stuff right now, okay? So this is sort of you know cheaper strategy. This requires a lot of real-time computation. There's quite quite a bit of real-time computation. In power, power, you often need to power system, you often need to figure things out in one or two seconds. Okay, so it's not trivial to be able to do this in real time. There's a huge amount of, for example, you want to people working on online algorithms works on this problem. There are people whose you know, focus is on how do you make decisions fast once you see something happen? Okay, so that's that's a challenge there. Okay, so of course, then you know we'll look at you know why we need a salary services. We'll go a little bit into the physics of the system, right? You know how 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 do you know there's a supply demand imbalance basically, right? Second is you know how much do you need, right? How do you compute a number out of this? And then if you're selling this, how, how much money do you get? How do you get paid? And so this, right now this class will look a little bit of why you need this or how do you tell? If you're a generator, we don't monitor things right. So if the load changes, when we change our load, we don't call the system router first and say we're changing our load. We just change our load. So how does the system operator know that the load is being changed? Same thing as a transmission line outage. How does the system know that there is a transmission line outage? How, 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 generator failure, how does the system operator know there's generator failure? Okay, so one thing to remember in power system is, let's say for the transmission grid, what is the monitoring rate in the system? For example, if the generator goes offline, how long does it take to send this signal, this explicit signal to the system operator? Anybody knows? What is the sort of the sampling frequency of our system? That's so you're offering a generator, your generator blew up. Eventually this gets to the to the operator. Operator will figure this out. How long is this in Austin? How long does it take? Any guesses?
so there is a standard, right? So there is a standard time that the at least North American system is set for. It does depend on the communication technology, not so much the distance, right? So we are a much worse technology than the internet. Right? On the internet, anything happens, you figure out essentially in microseconds. That's not the case in power system. So often do you think, how long does it take for us to figure this out? Explicitly get a signal that says this generator blew up. Right, so you get this feedback in about four seconds. Okay, so basically the way the power system works is everything is being sampled every four seconds. So you check the line every four seconds, you check the generator every four seconds. This is called a SCADA system. I forgot what that stands for, but this is called SCADA system. That's how we check. Okay, so if your generator blows up, the system probably figures out, finds this out explicitly in four seconds. You have a signal that checks the generator, it's no longer there, reflects it, this is out. There's various reasons for the, this thing being so slow. Okay, there's very, a lot of things happening in four seconds. <laughs> you know, now, today, you watch a NBA game, you figure out what happened in the game, much less than four seconds, right? So the reason we do this is one, the communication network is old, it's proprietary, it's not on the internet, it's basically fiber communication backed up by microwave links. It's actually very difficult to hack because you can't really hack this thing. But that's just old technology is four seconds. Okay? But you want to do something before that. Okay? You basically, you don't want to wait four seconds to figure out something happened, and then take action. Your system probably, if you wait until then, your system you know, probably already desynchronous at that time. Okay? So the, re the really what happens, so you, the way you figure this out, as you figure out by looking at frequency of the system. The really the signal that communicates supply and demand imbalance is frequency. Okay. So we have a 60 hertz system. Right, so we have 60 hertz. Uh, Europe and Asia have 50 hertz. But the thing is, this is a hard-coded number into our system. Where does this 60 hertz come from? Why is the system 60 hertz? What is physically 60 hertz in our system? Right. If you take a oscilloscope, you put it into a wall, you do measure a waveform that's 60 hertz. That's very close to 60 hertz. That's probably with, you know, within 0.5% of 60 hertz at that point. And so, but what physically is 60 hertz? Our system. Why is it? Why is this waveform out of the wall sixty hertz? Or in the other, you know, in Europe, why is it fifty hertz? Like, what, what what is physically different between those two grids? Right, so the grid is 60 hertz, but that's just electricity. That's electrons that's, that's flowing back and forth, right? So that's not the physical reason why 60 hertz. The, your wires doesn't care what this number is. It just wires. What cares this is 60 hertz? What physically is 60 hertz in the system? Right. All the generators you have in the system is spinning at 60 hertz. Okay, your generator is 60 hertz generators. The physically, the thing that's spinning is spinning at 60 hertz. That's what's 60 hertz of the system. This is the rate of synchronous generators. Okay, so remember the way we generate electricity is you take a magnet, right? You turn a magnet, then you can generate electricity. The magnets are turning at 60 hertz. Okay, so these, these things are large and it's quite impressive that they turn at 60 hertz, but this is the speed they turn, okay? Now, so you have a generator here that this thing is going around 60 hertz, okay? So you have a generator that operates 60 hertz. This number needs to be very close to 60 hertz. These are huge machines. If you try to spin this thing at 59 hertz, again, this machine blows up. Okay, if this thing doesn't spin at 60 hertz, it will blow up. So either spins at 60 hertz or doesn't spin. 
There's a cut very close with this frequency. Okay. Now you connect to a load, right? So um, I have a machine that's sort of turning around happily at 60 hertz, connecting to a load. This is applying the load, AC power to the load, and uh, so on. What happens now if your load increase? Let's say I have a load. You come in and you plug something in into the load. What, what happens? Where does the power come from? You turn on your light. You have a generator, connect to a load, load increases, where does the power come from? What supplies this additional power to the load? How does the generator know you, your load has increased? Which way does it go? If I increase the load, how does the rate speed rate change? Uh, the right, speed will decrease, right? So this is how the generator knows. If load increases, where does the energy come from? The energy comes from the spinning inertia in this generator. Okay. So you spin the inertia at 60 hertz. We you slow this down slightly, that rotational energy now has to go somewhere. That is the energy that supplies the load. Okay, so load increase, this thing slows down. Okay, this thing slows down, right? So this is again, that's what again makes the electricity system very different than the internet. The internet, if you want more data, you have to ask for more data. You tell the router, you tell your internet service provider, I want more data. Go to the source, give me more data. In power, if you're low, you just turn yourself on. Uh, what, you ha what happens is you have all this mechanical inertia that's stored somewhere. You have energy storage that supplies this load if it increases. So now this generator knows this load increase has slowed down. So what happens is now this will increase the fuel input. Right? So I slow down, I increase some fuel input, I want to generate more power. This brings up, brings the frequency back to 60, okay? Right, so this is, in some sense, the entire reason why the power system works. As we have a fixed, we have a hard-coded frequency that everybody needs to measure to. We, this is hard-coded, right? This, you know you're supposed to have 60 hertz. So if you, if you can measure your change away from 60 hertz, you know what is happening in the rest of the system in supply and demand. If you know this, you can change your own actions to restore yourself to back to 60 hertz. And this is how the system works. Okay? This is the entire reason why we have an interconnected power system. Right? Everything here happens without any explicit communication. NASA is just the physics of rotating things. Right? This is electric load causes a change in the frequency of the actual magnetic field. This causes a change in the mechanical rotation of the turbine. Then by putting more fuel, you can restore the rotation of the turbine. Okay? So it's very, very important that uh, your turbine needs to measure this frequency. And as a system operator, what you do is if you're sitting in the system operator room, you have a bunch of screens. One of your screens is dedicated to measuring the system frequency. If this thing goes to like 59.9, is where you have things start to go really, really wrong. You really look at this number extremely closely. Okay, you know, so frequency, right? This is the the entire thing that uh, why system works. This is also the reason if you remember back to the uh, sort of the nuclear disaster in Japan, right? What Japan had is Japan had two systems. One was 50 hertz, one was 60 hertz. The 60 hertz system was running out of power. The 50 hertz system was fine, has excess generation capability. The question is why not just connect a line between the two and get the power from it? The reason is they're fundamentally measuring different frequencies. You connect that line, both system blows up. 
I mean, okay, so this is where the source of really frequency is important. This also happened in Europe. There was a European outage that basically separated the European grid into two halves. One was faster than 50, one was slower than 50. And for several years, the clocks in Europe didn't synchronize because they were measuring their frequency. And some clocks are measuring faster than others, right? So this is, again, this is very much, you can, right, you, so one cannot stress enough why the system works is because this local feedback structure. As 60 hertz is hard coded into the system. So in every outage, you'll see, if you read the newspaper, some guy will say, well, I determined this system frequency change, so we have to do low shedding. Then the reporter will ask, well, what happens if you don't shed low, the frequency keeps drops? The literal answer is things will blow up <laughs> with frequency drops. Okay, so some, something will blow up. Okay. So your again, thing to remember is that the generators can only operate at a very narrow band. A narrow band. Around 60 hertz. Okay, so this is not, if you, this for example, typically 59, 0.9 to 60.1. Okay, so this is, this is our, again, machines that's bigger than the size of this room. Rotating 60 hertz is not slow. Okay, you really don't want to mess around with how fast they rotate. Okay, these are huge machines that rotate. And so what happens is protection will trip if the frequency deviates too far. Okay, so there's physical protections that's connecting this generator to the grid. If you're deviated very far away from this frequency, those protections will trip the generator offline. That, that's right. So again, this is a physical trip. It's not something through electronic can hack. It's just the wire connecting it, matching the frequency. Okay. So one thing that you really care about is you make sure you recover system operator needs to make sure that you recover your frequency fast enough. Because if your frequency starts to drop. What that leads to, that can lead to a cascade problem of your generator keep tripping offline, right? If your generator trips, you have less generation, you have, then the other generator will trip and so on. So all the generators, so that's why if you determine, you, decide, you look at frequency, if you cannot recover, you drop the load. You want to keep the rest of the generators on. You want to avoid large scale blackout. And for some of you that's taking one energy, for one energy, I don't know where you are right now, but the large part of one turbine design is be able to ride through this kind of frequency event. Uh, you, wind turbines now are required to survive this kind of events. <laughs> and uh, it's sort of easier for a pile electronic thing to survive this than say you are actually big synchronous generator. Okay. So we'll stop here today. Next class, we'll look at how do you provide this kind of reserve? What is providing this reserve? And how do you get paid if you find this kind of reason? I think to remember is frequency is really important for the power system.